Hi, it's Dr. Ogden. Uh, we're going to be looking at DNA, its structure and function, and some other related issues to DNA. Um, it took a number of years before scientists recognized that the molecule that carried the information, the genetic information, was DNA. But once that was determined, uh, basically there were a number of different labs that were trying to to find out what was the structure of DNA and how is it that it carried the genetic information. And one of the most um, uh, important players in this process was uh, a woman by the name of Rosalind Franklin. And she was this amazing scientist who spent lots of years and became very good at doing what's called X-ray crystallography. So this is where you take an X-ray so source and you shine it through this lead screen. It then becomes a beam of X-rays um, which then go through the sample of whatever it is you're trying to determine its molecular structure and so in this case DNA and so you had to crystallize DNA and it would then um, have the x-ray shine through it and then you would get this diffraction pattern that would be able to be detected by this plate and essentially you would make kind of a, a photograph right a, a black and white photograph of, of the of the pattern of the spread of the um, x-rays as they would come through the crystal and so she made a lots of these different pictures and one of the and a series of these uh, became the ones that were very important to leading to the discovery of DNA and this is one of the most important ones right here this photograph so she actually never found out the exact structure of DNA even though she was working on these photographs it turns out that two other men who happened to be in the right time looking at the right things and, and then getting putting all the pieces together actually came up with the structure of DNA and this was Watson and Crick so they're the ones that that um, wrote a paper and this is the very first line of their paper I love this it says we wish to suggest a structure for the salt of deoxyribose nucleic acid DNA this structure has novel features which are of considerable biological interest. Now, I always think that's probably the understatement of all science, science sentences ever because really DNA has been the key to modern biology. And Watson and Crick were able to actually see those photographs that Rosen Franklin had made and together with the models that they had been working on, they were more theorists, they uh, were able to put it all together and come up with the structure of DNA. And so we now know that DNA is, is kind of like a ladder that's twisted on itself. So it's a, a double heli helical twisting molecule. And if you, we've looked at this before, but if you look at the side of one of the ladders, then you have, it's made up of three parts, a sugar, a phosphate, and a nitrogenous base, as seen as over here, right? The sugar, phosphate, and nitrogenous base. And those bases can either be A, G, C, or T. And then these, the sugar and phosphates alternate and become the backbone with the nitrogenous bases sticking off to the side. And then you put those together and you get the double stranded um, DNA molecule. And G's always bind with C's and T's always bind with A's. And these are just three ways to you know represent the DNA molecule. So something that's important about DNA is because it carries all of the genetic information it then must be carried throughout each successive generation. So when does replication of the DNA occur? We, we learned this before and this was in the synthesis phase, right? Right prior to uh, mitosis or meiosis um, in the S phase during interphase. And so DNA replication was also discovered to have a really um, interesting way in, in which it's carried out. It turns out that DNA um, replicates itself very similar for bacteria or for eukaryotes. Um, in bacteria, there's one, one starting point and it goes all the way around the circular piece of DNA and then finishes. In eukaryotes, because of the size of our genomes and we have these linear chromosomes, um, you, you have multiple origins of replication along a chromosome. So there could be one chromosome with multiple origins of replication. And then you get these bubbles that form and, and the DNA is replicated, so copied, right? until the bubbles run into each other. So it's as if you start with the parental strand, you unzip it, and this is what Watson and Crick even postulated was possible, is you could unzip DNA and use each side as a, as a, um, as a uh, template strand to then form a new strand on the other side. And what you end up with then are two daughter DNA molecules 
that are copies of each other. And in genetics, remember, we refer to these two daughter DNA molecules as sister chromatids. So this is what happens across um, eukaryote, eukaryotes when they go through DNA replication with these multiple origins of replication until you end up with the two daughter DNA molecules. Now, I want to just make mention of one molecule in particular that's really important in this process. There's a mul multitude of different proteins and enzymes that are involved in this, but one in particular is called DNA polymerase. And DNA polymerase is the molecule that does the copying. And it's a very faithful molecule. It makes very few mistakes, uh, but it does make mistakes every once in a while, and of course we call those mutations. Now, DNA then has all of the genetic information, but how does that genetic information make the phenotype, right? Well, the phenotype, as we've stated before, are all of the specific traits that were coded for by the genotype. And so you can think about it in this way. The genotype leads to the phenotype, right? We used to say, you know, big P, little P, or big P, big P led to purple flowers. But we can also break this down at a molecular level and say DNA leads to RNA, which leads to eventually polypeptides or proteins. And I just want to rem remind you that we're not forgetting that the environment is also an important part of determining the ultimate phenotype that is produced. But we're, for the meantime, we're going to ignore the environmental effects. So here's a close-up of a cell where we're looking at the nucleus here and then the cytoplasm on this side. DNA is housed inside of the nucleus in eukaryotes and the DNA never leaves the nucleus. So DNA goes through a process called transcription to create an RNA copy of a gene. This RNA copy we call a messenger RNA. This RNA molecule can leave the nucleus through the pore and come outside into the cytoplasm where it can undergo the process of translation and then eventually become a protein. So here's where we're going from DNA to RNA to protein through two processes, transcription and translation. We're going to look at both of those in detail. So if we look at this even kind of zoomed up a little bit, so here is some DNA, here is a gene, and we zoom up to look at the actual nucleotides. What's really happening then is you're going from a DNA strand, you're copying and getting the RNA complementary basis copy of this. So A's bind with U's. Remember in RNA we have U's instead of T's. C's bind with G's and um, the, it doesn't show this here, but a T would bind, bind with an A. And the message that is encoded in the genetics is written in three letter triplets of bases. We call these codons and each codon codes for one amino acid. So the process of, tr of transcription is going from DNA to RNA, and the process of translation is going from RNA to a polypeptide, where you translate from nucleotide language into a different language, which, which is written in amino acids, and then eventually becomes a polypeptide or a protein. Um, a number of, of uh, scientists um, figured out the genetic code, and this was a really important um, hurdle that we made in science where we knew, we started to figure out which triplets or which codons code for particular amino acids. So UUU, if you have a, an RNA molecule and it has a UUU, then you know that's going to code for phenylalanine, as will UUC, but UUA will code for leucine. So look at this at this base, as you can see, there are 64 possible bases because if you have three different um, nucleotides forming one codon, there are three, and there and you have four different nucleotides that can be put into that triplet, then there are 64 different possible combinations. You can see along here we have the kind of the first base is indicated by the column. I'm sorry, by the row, the second base ind is indicated by the column, and the third base is indicated by the rows within each of these boxes. And as you look across here, notice that you see some patterns forming. First of all, you see a start codon, or a that also is the same codon as methionine, and you might imagine that that has something to do with the start of the genetic message in, in any gene, and that's true. You also have codons that are called stop codons, and as you might imagine, those codons tell 
your body that that is where the genetic message ends. That's where the gene ends. And then you have a, all the rest of the amino acids. There are 20 total amino acids that are shared across life, with a few exceptions. And these amino acids also have patterns. So look at, and you can see like here in threonine, you see that it doesn't matter what the third position um, nucleotide is, as long as it's A, C, something, it's going to be a threonine. And that is very common for many of these. Or you might have it where um, two, uh, a, a CAU or CAC ref is a histidine, or AAU or AAC is an aspar uh, asparagine, and you see these patterns forming. Now notice that if you, there's a few times when you can actually change the first position and still maintain the first amino acid. For example, down here, CUA is leucine, but if the C changes to a U, UUA, it's still leucine. That's also true over here for arginine. AGA to CGA is still arginine. However, there is never a case where you can change the second position, the second nucleotide position in a triplet, and still maintain the same amino acid. It does not occur. Now what is an interesting is that this genetic code is shared by all organisms. And so this is why you can take a gene out of one organism, like this firefly, and put that gene inside of a tobacco plant and it can function and it can work. Genes can be, can be taken out of one organism, put in another organism. We actually do this quite often where we take human genes that are of interest and put those into bacteria and the bacteria will make the protein product from that gene. This is a really common method that we now use to make um, human insulin and that is then given to diabetic patients.